New research is changing everything we thought we knew about choline's impact on the cow and her calf, and top scientists have a lot to say about it. They are presenting new research that supports choline as a required nutrient to optimize milk production, choline as a required nutrient to support a healthy transition, choline as a required nutrient to improve calf health and growth, and choline as a required nutrient to increase colostrum quantity. This new research is solidifying choline's role as a required nutrient for essentially every cow, regardless of health status, milk production level, or body condition score. Learn more about the science that is changing the game and the choline source that is making it happen. Reassure Precision Release Choline from Balchem. Visit balchem.com slash scientists say to learn more. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Kim Jones, a member of the marketing team at Balchem. And today, we welcome Dr. Greg Penner from the University of Saskatchewan to discuss gut health in cattle and the dietary factors that influence it. Dr. Penner is a professor in the Department of Animal and Poultry Science and holds a Centennial Enhancement Chair in Ruminant Nutritional Physiology at the University of Saskatchewan. He obtained his B.S. and M.S. degrees at the University of Saskatchewan and his Ph.D. from the University of Alberta. <coughs> Dr. Penner has published more than 170 papers and is the co-editor-in-chief for the Canadian Journal of Animal Science. His research focuses on the evaluation of factors affecting gastrointestinal function in cattle and covers nutritional challenges and strategies to, to accelerate the recovery of gastrointestinal tract for calves, feedlot cattle, and lactating cattle. His team has developed and implemented novel techniques to evaluate total tract and regional changes in the gastrointestinal tract barrier function and continues to work to understand factors affecting absorptive metabolism and adaptation. Thanks, Dr. Penner. The floor is now yours. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about, you know, some of the factors that are influencing gut function in cattle, really focusing on some of the work uh, we've done here at the University of Saskatchewan. Where I want to start is by looking at what the critical roles are for a healthy gastrointestinal tract in, in ruminants. And I think, you know, historically, we have focused mostly on the absorptive and secretory components because that was the classical nutrition example or classical aspects of nutrition uh, that we were historically focused on. So really looking at how the gastrointestinal tract promotes feed digestion, digestive passage, uh, as well as urea recycling. I'm gonna take a little side um, to spend some time on regulation of luminal pH. And, and I purposely have luminal pH, not just ruminal pH. Uh, and I'm going to emphasize the importance on nutrient absorption as well as, as they are really critical aspects to delivering nutrients for productive livestock and the gastrointestinal tract play a critical role there. The other two major functions are in the barrier function as well as in a communicative role. So from a barrier perspective, we're going to spend a fair bit of time today looking at that. We need to recognize the gastrointestinal tract has the largest surface area uh, where it is exposed to microorganisms. And because of that, it really fo or functions as the first arm of the immune response. And within that, it needs to facilitate nutrient absorption while preventing the movement of pathogens or antigens across that tissue, or even uh, managing the interaction of those um, components within the tissue. And there's a number of ways that the gastrointestinal tract can facilitate this in a number of circumstances when uh, these functions at least uh, have a transient uh, impairment in their ability to regulate these processes. The third one we're not gonna spend much time on, but I think it's an area that needs a lot more attention in, in research and that's on the communicative role. So looking at how crosstalk occurs between the host cattle and its microbiota, looking at the regulatory pathways and potential to mitigate um, host responses through nutrient sensing and nutrient signaling. And I gave you an example of some of the uh, hormones as well as some of the compounds that are involved in, in these uh, regulatory uh, 
um, sensing mechanisms. So focusing back on luminal uh, regulation of luminal pH, uh, you know, we're almost uh, 30 years now uh, since Dr. Allen has published this paper looking at some of the factors that affect regulation of, of ruminal pH, or at least acid from the rumen. And even back in the late 90s, it was recognized that absorption of short-chain fatty acids were the predominant uh, factor influencing pH regulation. And yet, if we look back at the 90s, uh, this is the same time that the effective fiber system came out. And so much of the work actually focused on promoting salivary bicarbonate supply and chewing activity as a proxy to try to stimulate buffer supply into the rumen and hence regulation of ruminal pH. We did some work during, during my PhD to challenge whether it's really uh, absorption of short chain fatty acids that's regulating pH. And in this study, we use lambs and we expose them to either uh, a control treatment or an oral glucose drench. And we applied that oral glucose drench to induce a reduction in ruminal pH. And based on the response to that oral glucose drench, we characterized lambs as being resistant or susceptible to a low pH or induction of low pH. When we look at the data for how we can characterize exposure to low pH, we saw that statistically, and again, this is a retrospective classification, but uh, our resistant animals had less time that pH was below uh, 5.8 in terms of uh, this study, uh, at least relative to our susceptible animals. And logically, the control animals, which were never challenged, really did not spend time below pH 5.8. So using that data set, we then evaluated the ability of those animals to absorb short-chain fatty acids across the isolated rumen uh, ex vivo. The first, first point I need to bring up is, uh, in this case, what we were able to show is induction of our low pH, low ruminal pH, did not negatively affect the uptake of acetate or butyrate relative to the control animals. So this is a really important finding because it allows us to understand differences between our resistant and our susceptible populations, understanding that the control animals were not different than uh, animals or a subgroup of animals that were challenged. When we compare our resistance and susceptible, we can see here very clear increases in the rates of uptake for acetate and butyrate across the ruminal epithelium. So this really supported our hypothesis that if we have ways or we have an in inherent capacity for individual animals to have greater rates of short chain fatty acid absorption, they should also have greater ability to regulate ruminal pH, and probably more important from a practical standpoint, greater ability to absorb energy substrates that will contribute to productive outcomes. We've gained knowledge in terms of understanding why that helps regulate ruminal pH, and so this is a diagram from a review article uh, that Jörg Aschenbach published uh, quite a few years ago now. Highlighted in, in the uh, yellow box shows that our classical mechanism for short chain fatty acid absorption, where we historically thought most of that absorption would occur via passive diffusion. There's some very major challenges with that concept in that when short chain fatty acids get into the rumen epithelial cells, those short chain fatty acids must dissociate based on the pH and the pKa and we know that some of those protons will be recycled back into the rumen, challenging whether absorption of short-chain fatty acids would actually stabilize ruminal pH. But knowledge has advanced where we now know uh, a very major mechanism for short-chain fatty acid absorption, and that's through uh, anion exchange. So in this case, short-chain fatty acids in the dissociated state, which is the most abundant form in the rumen are absorbed in exchange for the release of bicarbonate. So this bicarbonate acts just like it would if it was coming from saliva, will react with protons to form water and carbon dioxide through the carbonic anhydrase reaction. And we know that that bicarbonate pool is largely coming from arterial circulation. 
So this really has provided a, a new outlook on how ruminal pH and luminal pH is regulated because these same processes happen across the gastrointestinal tract, particularly in the large intestine where there is uh, substantial short chain fatty acid uh, production uh, by the microbiota um, again. So if we think about that from a modeling perspective, how important are the relative, relative contributions of salivary bicarbonate and rumen epithelial bicarbonate. And Jan Dijkstra uh, went through and did some modeling exercises to give us an understanding of what the relative differences would be. And what we can see is regardless if we're on a high roughage diet or if we're on a high grain diet, rumen epithelial bicarbonate supply is at least uh, as substantial as salivary bicarbonate supply and when we get into diets where cattle can consume feed faster, fermentability is higher, and the prom promotory forces for rumination are depressed, we actually see that rumen epithelial bicarbonate becomes more important or at least more abundant than uh, salivary bicarbonate supply. So again, emphasizing how important the role of the gastrointestinal tract is in terms of maintaining that luminal pH. And certainly we can't get too far into the weeds because for those short chain fatty acids to be absorbed, we need them to move between the site of fermentation, which is typically at the ruminal fluid rumen mat interface and have those VFA migrate throughout that rumen digestus so they get exposed to the rumen epithelium. And again, we can see that model. And I think this is really where some of the uh, fiber system benefits can come from, because if we have factors that are stimulating rumination, we are indirectly or directly stimulating rumen motility and rumen motility will facilitate that equilibrium, equilibration, or sorry, equilibration between uh, the site of VFA formation and its exposure to the rumen epithelium. So again, absorption is, is really critical for proper function of the gastrointestinal tract. It also supports productive outcomes. And we've spent some time looking at the rate of adaptation. And, and we can think of adaptation as occurring in two different uh, kind of modes or two different rates. We can have functional adaptation that occurs quite rapidly, and we can have morphological adaptations that occur quite uh, slowly. So this is one of the studies we conducted evaluating rates of adaptation from a functional perspective. These animals were fed either a control diet, which was essentially a very high forage diet, a grass hay based diet, or we adapted them to a diet that contained 50% concentrate fed for three days, seven days, 14 days, or 21 days. As you can see, we did not have any changes in papillae density. We also didn't have any changes in effective surface area, which we wouldn't have expected to have simply because of the short-term duration of treatment exposure. That said, we did see increases in the rates of uh, acetate and butyrate flux. Butyrate in particular responded linearly, again, confirming that we can have very rapid changes in functional activity of that rumen epithelium without corresponding changes in surface area. If we look at more long-term adaptation, you know, very classical work coming out of the mid 80s uh, out of Germany, showing that when dairy cattle are changed from a high energy ration to a low energy ration during uh, the dry uh, phase, we see a reduction in the absorbed the surface area of the rumen epithelium. And after exposure to a high energy lactation diet, we see increases in absorptive surface area with those increases requiring approximately six to eight weeks to, re to achieve maximal surface area from the time of diet change. So this is obviously a very prolonged change in terms of uh, uh, papillae surface area and ultimately capacity to absorb the short chain fatty acids. And they really did confirm that the increase in surface area stimulated short chain fatty acid absorption. In this case, they're looking at disappearance. So greater rates of disappearance were observed for adapted cattle relative to those non-adapted cattle. 
And I think this just highlights, you know, the importance that the gastrointestinal tract is playing from a functional perspective. If we want highly productive cattle that are able to mount an appropriate immune response, able to promote appropriate productive productive responses, we need to ensure that nutrient transport processes are optimized and, and try to avoid some of the disruptions that may occur. The next area we're going to focus on is, is the barrier uh, function of the gastrointestinal tract. And at this point, we really need to start thinking about how that gastrointestinal tract can promote uh, those barrier function uh, characteristics. Some of that comes from the structural or characteristics of uh, the cells and, and adjacent cells, knowing that tight cell junctions are really uh, the adherent proteins, uh, so uh, extracellular proteins uh, or uh, proteins that span uh, the extra into the extracellular domain, helping to connect adjacent cells to form uh, a porous barrier, but, but a, a barrier that has uh, restriction in terms of the size and the charge of compounds that can cross between these proteins. We also have a second line of, of, of defense, which are our adherent junctions. Again, a number of proteins that play a role in forming these, uh, these junctional complexes. Desmosomes as we move more uh, basally. And then finally, gap junctions, which also not only serve as a, uh, a barrier, but also serve as a way that cells uh, that are adjacent to each other can communicate, kind of like if uh, two neighbors were using the old landline style telephones and had a way to let a neighbor know that something was happening uh, within their uh, yard or within their house. So this has been pretty well characterized uh, in uh, the intestinal regions of mammals. Uh, there's less information known on how this actually works within the rumen, although there, there are some decent studies looking at immunohistochemistry localization or immunohistochemistry based localization of some of these proteins. What we need to understand is that barrier function encompasses a lot more than just the tight cell junctions. So in particular, we can have changes in the passage rate or the movement of digesta throughout the gastrointestinal tract. And when we think about the intestinal regions, which have been more well characterized, we also have secretory processes. So we have mucus that can be secreted to help form a non-stirred layer and a barrier preventing um, molecules or pathogens from interacting with uh, the cells lining the gastrointestinal tract. We can also have secretory compounds, whether that be immunoglobulins, uh, or um, uh, antimicrobial peptides uh, that can be secreted from specialized cells within the epithelium to help protect and mitigate potential impacts from the luminal environment and its influence uh, on the host function. When we compare that to the rumen environment, it's very different. Uh, the rumen is not a mucosa per se because there is no known mucus secretion from, from the ruminal epithelium. However, rather than having those secretory processes, uh, the ruminal epithelium, the reticulum, and the omasum all have a stratified uh, cell architecture where multiple cell strata and multiple cell layers, sometimes within a strata, help to serve as protection from abrasive ruminal contents uh, from damaging more basal cell layers. So in the ruminal epithelium, we have this stratified uh, stratified squamous epithelium with the stratum corneum really being non-active. So we could consider them as, as uh, dead cells, but cells that are still adherent and cells that are uh, filled with keratin to provide structural protection from uh, the luminal contents. As we move into the stratum granulosum, this is the layer where the bulk of the tight cell junctions would be formed. And as we move into the spinosum and the basal, we would start seeing our adherent junctions and our desmos desmosomes and our gap junctions. So same barrier uh, processes from, from a, a structural perspective, recognizing that some of the other characteristics like mucus and um, 
antimicrobial secretions, whether that be through immunoglobulins or uh, defensins, are not present within the ruminal environment. So given the structural differences, the question uh, often came up, which region of the gastrointestinal tract in ruminants is more permeable? We conducted some ex vivo studies to evaluate permeability to mannitol as well as larger molecules like inulin uh, across the gastrointestinal tract in healthy ruminants. And the general pattern we observed was that regions with high microbial abundance, so that occurring in the rumen in the omasum, and then again occurring in the proximal and distal colon, tend to have lower permeability based on lower flux of our permeability markers. This also tends to indicate that regions of the small intestine might actually be more prone to movement of pathogens or antigens across those regions. And at least at that time, that was not a major focus of, of ruminant nutrition or ruminant physiology research. We further characterized potential antigens using LPS as a, a model molecule for, for antigens in the gastrointestinal tract and found some very interesting outcomes where concentrations were expectedly high in the rumen, very low in the jejunum, and again, elevated in the ileum uh, relative to the cecum colon and in the rectum. And this is really interesting because, again, as I pointed out, the ileum has a higher potential, at least in healthy animals, for permeability to smaller sized molecules. The ileum is also a location with the in, within the intestinal tract that is associated with Peyer's patches or the gastro, gastrointestinal associated lymphatic tissue. So high probability for pathogen recognition and the ability to resolve uh, challenges. And at the same time, an area where we probably start seeing more fermentation uh, and a higher microbial uh, density. So all logical concepts, but really something we had not known at that time. So this really challenged whether, you know, leaky gut conditions or compromised uh, barrier function of the gastrointestinal tract would be most prominent in the rumen or whether it would be most prominent uh, post-ruminally. So this got us interested in some of the, the natural factors that cause cattle to go off feed. And, and I don't think we need to look very far in the literature to find examples, but I do want to point out some examples that might pose nutritional challenges for cattle in terms of a gut function perspective. I think most people would be aware of, of the graph on the left or the diagram on the left that was published in Journal Dairy Science uh, by Dr. Goff, looking at the interaction between different uh, transition disorders and immunosuppression and, and really highlighting how many of these factors are interrelated. What's really important to recognize is that any of these factors seem to have uh, a related influence on decreasing dry matter intake. And in fact, de decreasing dry matter intake also predisposes animals to some of these uh, factors. So whether cause or effect is, is um, not necessarily not necessary to debate today. Point is um, low dry matter intake as calving approaches and hence exposure to transition disorders also cause a reduction in dry matter intake. That's been shown in the diagram on the right where we can look at elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines and they tend to correspond with low dry matter intake in a dose dependent manner. And uh, some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines work directly uh, within the hypothalamus to uh, cause a reduction in dry matter intake. So there is a causative effect of inflammatory responses on uh, dry matter intake characteristics. So certainly the transition uh, period is a time where cattle are highly at risk for transient reductions in feed intake. We know work from Dr. Baumgard and Dr. Rhodes has shown that heat stress events are potent reducers of dry matter intake. And if we get outside of the dairy industry and we start thinking about feedlot cattle, we know that newly received feedlot cattle, especially highly stressed feedlot cattle, often eat much less than we would anticipate uh, 
during the first week and maybe even into the second and third week uh, after arrival at a feedlot. We know again that disease states like respiratory disease cause a, a massive reduction in dry matter intake. And in this case, the extent of that reduction can be as much as 80%. Uh, so an 80% reduction in feed intake for seven to 10 days. So it can be quite a dramatic uh, alteration in feed intake patterns. And then again, whether we're dealing with feedlot cattle or dairy cattle, we can have management events that might uh, challenge the ability for cattle to consume appropriate dry matter intake, whether this be through sorting or pen changes and, and the hierarchy changes that occur as a result, or simply management challenges where feed delivery uh, might not be optimized uh, for those pens and, and cattle might go without feed for hours uh, in each day. We started evaluating some of these challenges, first looking at weaning as one of the potentials that might compromise total tract barrier function. So in this case, we were using Holstein bull calves. We had a group that was weaned uh, on day 42 after a seven day step down period versus a group that was not weaned. As we'd expect, uh, as we start imposing our step down milk replacer weaning protocol, they consumed less milk replacer and they compensated by trying to eat more starter dry matter. However, what we did show, and in this case, we used an oral pulse dose of chromium EDTA as an indicator of barrier function. So chromium EDTA should not be absorbed across the gastrointestinal tract through passive permeation or through uh, transcellular transport processes. We think it will cross when those tight cell junctions or other barrier molecules are compromised. And so the appearance of chromium EDTA in blood and then the excretion of that chromium in urine can be used as an indicator for barrier function of the gastrointestinal tract. So when you're looking at the data on the right, what we can see are two major factors. So if we focus on just the solid bars, the solid black bars first, because we have that treatment by weak interaction, we can see that as calves progressed in age, there was a progressive improvement or a progressive tightening of the gastrointestinal tract. What we did see is that group that was weaned, shown in the white bars, we completely disrupted that barrier function uh, process through that aggressive weaning protocol. So rapid changes in nutrient intake or exposure to stressful periods, which weaning could be considered, may have an effect to reduce the barrier function uh, of the gastrointestinal tract. We also started looking at off-feed events because of the number of uh, situations that happen both in the dairy industry, but also in the beef industry, where cattle may be exposed to off-feed events. And this is going to tie back into kind of the more holistic view of uh, a functioning, healthy functioning gastrointestinal tract. But in this study, we used uh, 18 uh, cannulated Angus heifers, exposed them to 75% of their ad libitum feed intake, 50% or 25% of their ad libitum feed intake. So they went through feed intake reductions of 25%, 50% or 75%. We did this over uh, a series of five periods. So we had a baseline period where we measured ad libitum feed uh, intake, and then we imposed our feed restriction. We measured responses at the end of baseline, end of feed restriction, end of the first recovery period, which was a week long, and the end of the third recovery period, which was also uh, a week long. The other point I want to highlight is this diet is, is not what I would consider a high-risk diet, and that's going to become important later. We have uh, over 40% NDF, uh, in this diet, relatively low starch concentration. Um, so really not a diet that I would expect would be high risk for ruminal challenges. The data I'm gonna show you is gonna divide the data into the baseline and feed restriction phases. And then we're gonna use the feed restriction phase as a start to evaluate a recovery response. Again, just characterizing the model when cattle are exposed to low feed intake, um, Obviously, we have our reduction in feed intake, and the consequent outcome is also a reduction in the concentration of short-chain fatty acids within the rumen. 
We've used this study or this model in a number of studies. Uh, we've also been able to show that when we expose uh, animals to low feed intake, we also alter conditions in other regions of the gastrointestinal tract. So exposure to low feed intake consistently increases ruminal pH, makes sense because there's less fermentable substrate entering the rumen, but we also see increases in pH in other reasons of the gastrointestinal tract where fermentation would occur, in this case in the proximal colon. We've been able to show in, in a number of studies that short chain fatty acid absorption rates are reduced uh, when exposed to feed restriction and they tend to be reduced in a dose dependent manner. You'll see the p-values here are indicating tendencies, but because we have a number of studies that show a very similar response, I'm gonna be a little liberal with those p-values and argue that these are real biological responses where short chain fatty acid absorption uh, is reduced. This is another study evaluating the impact of that short chain fatty acid absorption or the impact of uh, low feed intake on short chain fatty acid absorption. And we can see regardless if we're feeding a high forage or a moderate forage diet, when we impose restriction, we get a reduction in short chain fatty acid absorption. So it seems to be a very consistent response for cattle to reduce the absorption of short chain fatty acids when they go through a period of feed uh, restriction or off-feed events. Some of the response for reduced absorption can be explained by a reduction in the absorptive surface area. So this is a study where we exposed cattle to 25% of their voluntary intake for five days and we were able to show that ruminal papillae length width, the perimeter as well as the effective surface area were all reduced within that five day period. And probably what's most shocking to me or was what was most shocking at the time was we had nearly a 60% reduction in surface area occurring within that five days of low feed intake. And part of the reason I say this is shocking is if we look at the rate for surface area enlargement, we're looking at uh, a requirement of about six to eight weeks for maximal surface area to be achieved with a diet change, with an increase in energy supply. Yet when we feed the same diet, but we restrict energy intake simply through reductions in feed intake, we can get about a 60% reduction within five days. So it looks like benefits that come from long-term um, good practice to stimulate proliferative uh, adaptation can be eroded very quickly with uh, unintended events that cause cattle to go off feed. Now, it's not just our group that has shown this. If we focus on uh, the ad libitum group shown in the black bars and the group that was restricted to 40% of ad libitum intake, we can see changes in the uh, villi within the jejunum and the ileum in the intestine of dairy cattle. Again, work coming from uh, Dr. Baumgard's group. So again, pretty consistent where not only do we see reduced surface area within the rumen, but we're seeing evidence for reduced uh, surface area and reduced villi dimensions that would be supportive of absorption. So again, probably reduction in intestinal absorption, although I'm not aware of data that has uh, confirmed that speculation. More recently, we were trying to understand if there are even more broader effects that are occurring within the gastrointestinal tract. And so in this study, we exposed lambs to five days or 10 days of uh, low feed intake at 30% of their dry matter intake. And again, I'm gonna be a little liberal with p-values because most of them are tendencies, but we, we see a very consistent, uh, very consistent response across the gastro gastrointestinal tract where the weight of the reticulo rumen tissue actually tended to be reduced as we progress with advancing days of exposure to low feed intake. We see the abomasum weight was reduced, tendency for the weight of the duodenum to be reduced, a tendency for the weight of the jejunum, tendency for the weight of the ileum, and a reduction in the weight of the colon, 
when lambs are exposed to low feed intake. So it looks like it's beyond simply absorbed the surface area. We're probably starting to see some retrogression in terms of tissue size and tissue characteristics. Shockingly, we also saw changes in the weight of the liver. And in fact, in this case, there were no differences between the weight of the liver for lambs that had been exposed to five days of feed restriction or lambs exposed to 10 days of feed restriction. So it looks like decreased nutrient supply is rapidly signaling total splanchnic tissues to change either proliferation or change their rate of tissue turnover to allow for a smaller gastrointestinal tract. Now this makes a lot of sense if you think about kind of a evolutionary adaptation response where as animals go through a period of uh, low feed availability or low feed quality, it would make sense to reduce the maintenance energy requirement of the gastrointestinal tract as it occupies or, or utilizes a disproportionate amount of energy and amino acids. However, in production systems that we have currently, I would argue in many cases, cattle are not going through a decreased um, opportunity to consume feed. They just might have influences, whether they be physiological influences or management related events that cause a transient reduction in nutrient availability. So we're gonna start shifting some of our thoughts to how do, the, how do these exposures to low feed intake actually influence gastrointestinal tract function as the animal starts to recover. And we certainly also have shown, and, and we're not the only group to have shown this, uh, but when we expose animals to low feed intake, we do see a reduction in barrier function. And again, we used chromium EDTA in this case as an indicator uh, for um, our barrier function process. That reduction in barrier function, at least in, in a study conducted by Dr. Baumgard, related back to increased risk for inflammation. So again, it's not just we're measuring an increase in chromium EDTA excretion. We also see evidence that other molecules might be permeating across that gastrointestinal tract as endotoxin concentration went up and serum amyloid A as an indicator for a systemic immune response was also increased in concentration in circulation. So we think that at least transiently, exposure to off-feed events decreases the barrier function or increases the permeability of the gastrointestinal tract, predisposing animals to inflammatory responses. And there's been a lot of work showing that inflammation itself has a large metabolic cost on the host. Some very uh, popular work done by uh, Dr. Videra with uh, Dr. Baumgart has shown, you know, approximately a kilo of glucose being consumed by the immune system or to support the immune system in response to intravenous LPS. And some work done actually a little prior uh, out of the UK showing or an increase in the irreversible rate of loss for amino acids uh, largely by the liver, probably to support the acute phase protein response, to support uh, maintenance of plasma proteins through albumin and globulin, and probably also to support lymphocyte protein synthesis. So pretty potentially large impacts from uh, an energetic and amino acid perspective. Other more practical work uh, conducted on the feedlot side has shown that when using aspirin as, as a model to intentionally induce a leaky gut uh, approach for the, the majority of finishing, they observed a reduction in hot carcass weight, a reduction in ribeye area, uh, and reduced yield grade. So actually these cattle became fatter with less protein deposition, pretty consistent with what we would see in other mammals. So I think the argument can be made that there is a potential cost uh, to uh, a leaky gut situation. So what happens to these cattle as they recover? Well, um, we've shown in a number of studies that um, the magnitude that they go off feed affects the ability for them to recover their dry matter intake. So in this case, those cattle that were restricted to 25% of their voluntary dry matter intake actually took longer to resume to their ad libitum intake 
than those lamb or those cattle that were restricted to 75%. I also want you to pay attention to the dry matter intake during the first recovery phase. And what you can see that dry matter intake was lowest for those cattle that were exposed to the greatest severity of feed restriction. Despite that, those cattle also had the lowest pH. So in this case, we have a situation where cattle are not consuming as much feed, but still have a greater reduction in ruminal pH. And this has really highlighted how changes in feed intake might increase risk for ruminal acidosis as cattle start to resume feed intake as whatever situation is challenges them uh, is starting to resolve. So this probably helps explain why transition dairy cattle are at high risk for ruminal acidosis and very early lactation. It also makes some suggestions that uh, I hope we can confirm whether situations like mastitis or respiratory disease or maybe even ketosis or metritis might lead to secondary ruminal acidosis as they start to rebuild their dry matter intake. We know that we can mitigate some of that response simply by feeding a high forage diet. And there's been some supportive work coming out of the University of Alberta showing this response where they showed that if you feed cattle uh, a high forage diet for a very short period of time after calving, it reduces the risk for low ruminal pH and early lactation. In this study, we showed that if you feed a high forage diet, cattle are actually more likely to resume voluntary dry matter intake faster. And when fed a high forage diet, uh, we can essentially prevent a reduction in ruminal pH as those cattle return back to feed. When we have ruminal acidosis, we know that uh, we have issues that affect more than ruminal pH. And so this is just one example of data uh, that highlights changes in the pH across the gastrointestinal tract. There are many other studies that also show this response. But when we induce ruminal acidosis or low pH, we do certainly get low pH in the rumen. And we can also get low pH in the cecum, proximal and distal colon. So the question, and I, and I brought this up at the start of uh, this presentation, which region is most effective, affected? Is it the ruminal regions or, or the fermentation regions, or could it be post-ruminal regions that are most uh, impacted by nutritional challenges? So a PhD student in my group, uh, Claire Burtons, has come up with a novel approach to evaluate regional permeability of the gastrointestinal tract. And when I, when I argue regional permeability, we're looking at total tract permeability versus post-ruminal permeability. So using the same approach, we'll infuse chromium EDTA uh, into the rumen, and we infuse cobalt EDTA into the abomasum. Using urine collection or blood collection, we can evaluate the excretion of those compounds, assuming that all the cobalt must come from paracellular leakage uh, occurring post-ruminally, and chromium rep represents both ruminal and post-ruminal leakage. So using that, uh, Claire conducted a study where we exposed cattle to heat stress and we evaluated low DCAD or high DCAD diets when fed with uh, no buffer or an added dietary buffer. We were able to show that exposure to heat stress um, or sorry, exposure to heat stress with the buffer actually resulted in reduced total tract permeability. And most of that response was actually because of cobalt excretion, which we argue or are interpreting uh, would be reflective of post-ruminal permeability. Based on the data that we have, it looks like about 55 to 80% of the total permeability that we're measuring appears to be post-ruminal. And on top of that, when we apply nutritional strategies, it looks like it's mainly the post-ruminal regions uh, that are affected. So it's not just uh, Claire's study that has shown this response. Uh, we have another study where we expose cattle to low feed intake. And again, we did not see a response for total tract permeability, but when exposed to five days or 10 days of low feed intake, we actually observed that those animals had greater post-ruminal permeability than the control, 
And when we represent that as a function of total permeability, again, we're in that same range, somewhere between 55 uh, and almost 80% of the permeability occurring due to post-ruminal regions rather than ruminal regions. So this has really led us to an ongoing hypothesis and, and I've shown you the beef model. Uh, you can really extrapolate this back to a dairy model where there's a number of management of factors or physiological factors that cause cattle to be exposed to transient exposure to low feed intake. So this could be hours without feed or, or days with low feed intake. I've provided data today to show you that it alters the structure as well as the function uh, of the gastrointestinal tract, as well as the associated splanchnic tissues, and in particular the liver. These changes reduce the absorptive surface area. I've shown that we get a at least a transient reduction in barrier function, and we have a reduction in absorptive function, which decreases the ability for luminal or ruminal pH buffering. So as those cattle start to recover or build dry matter intake, we believe they're at high risk for ruminal acidosis. That increases risk for local in, uh, inflammation within the gastrointestinal tract. Again, predisposing animals to systemic inflammation, probably relating back to liver abscesses or risk for liver abscesses, and maybe even uh, risk for lameness uh, or uh, providing a, a theoretical link to uh, the classical suggestion of uh, laminitis. So the conclusions I'd like to leave you with, I hope I've convinced you a healthy gut requires a consistent supply of nutrients. We've used a low feed intake model to perturb that system. Uh, and I think a low feed intake model is, is a relevant challenge given some of the situations we see in uh, commercial production systems. When cattle are exposed to low feed intake, uh, we see a reduced nutrient supply and, and gut surface area. We see reduced nutrient absorption. I've highlighted increased risk for ruminal acidosis as they start rebuilding their dry matter intake. We see a transient reduction in barrier function, increasing risk for inflammation. And I think the place we really need to move now is to understand what factors actually can be used to mitigate negative effects caused by low feed intake, or what factors can we use to actually promote recovery of the gastrointestinal tract. With that, I'd like to thank uh, my team of grad students and, and collaborators that work hard to uh, help us advance this area. And certainly I'd like to thank funders that have supported the research uh, along this line. Thanks for your attention and, and I'd love to answer questions if there are some. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Penner. And before we get started with those questions, we'll share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer any of the questions submitted during today's webinar. Delivering the perfect ration for the rumen microbes might be more important and more challenging than feeding the cow. Nitrisher, Precision Release Nitrogen, delivers a consistent supply of rumen-protected nitrogen to improve animal performance, maximize profitability, and minimize nitrogen excretion into the environment. With Nitrisher, you get improved fiber digestion, increased microbial protein production, and reduced dependence on expensive protein sources with a high carbon footprint. Feed the microbes that feed your cows with Nitrisher Precision Release Nitrogen from Balchem. Visit balchem.com to learn more. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Penner, our first question is, it comes from Mark. What strategies should we consider to avoid disruption in in gastrointestinal permeability? That's, that's a great question, Mark. I think there's a number of strategies we can use. First of all, we need to make sure that we are imposing conditions um, that follow good production practices. So minimizing the amount of time that dairy cattle, for example, are without feed. Uh, I think the same thing can be applied to beef cattle. I think changes in our transition cow management have improved. So the use of 
a more controlled energy diet seems to reduce the reduction in dry matter intake around parturition. So really any factor that can be used to promote regular and sustained dry matter intake should be able to avoid those negative consequences. I think the challenge comes when we get into environmental situations, so heat stress conditions, or if we're getting into more physiological responses, uh, like we would have with, um, you know, metabolic diseases or, or transition diseases. And that's where I think we need to focus on nutritional strategies that might be able to mitigate those negative effects or strategies that we can help the gastrointestinal tract recover. Sure. Okay. Wonderful. The next question comes from Liza. Is the low LPS in the jejunum related to rate of passage? Um, we're still a little puzzled on that, to be honest. Uh, I think there's a number of things that could, could cause that low LPS concentration. First of all, there's secretion of alkaline phosphatase that'll occur through uh, the pancreas and, and alkaline phosphatase should bind LPS. So it might be that the LPS is there, but we're not measuring it because it's not free LPS. And I think what we're probably starting to see in the ELM, which would likely happen, uh, you know, beyond the jejunum. Jejunum is really a site of nutrient absorption, and hopefully, uh, the host is out competing the microbes for access to those nutrients. But in the ileum, I think we start to see more of a shift where microbial um, colonization and microbial activity is increasing. And anytime you have an increase in microbial activity or rapid growth rates, you have the potential for some of these antigens uh, to be released through those processes. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Paul. Beef on dairy calves reportedly have high rates of liver abscesses. What are your thoughts as to why? Yeah, that's that's a really challenging situation. I think there's a number of contributing factors. One is that I, th I think we need to know a lot more about how these beef on dairy calves are reared from the time of birth all, all the way to the time uh, that they're finished and, and sent to slaughter. There's ongoing work and, and I think there's good evidence to suggest that colostrum supply and milk feeding rates probably have long-term effects on the performance of these cattle. And I'm not convinced whether uh, or not they are fed adequate amounts of colostrum and adequate quantities of milk to support um, normal immune responses as well as development of the gastrointestinal tract. I think we also tend to see these cattle on high grain diets for longer days on feed. And that would also increase risk for liver abscesses. So I think we have many different places within the production chain of beef on dairy calves that we could look at to start reducing those risks. Okay. Next question comes from Valentina. Are there any markers in urine or feces to determine the severity of leaky gut? Um, this is an area we're, we're working in. I, I think there's a number of things we can look at. First one, mucin casts, I think, are a good example or a good evidence that there is some type of intestinal challenge occurring. It, it's probably not a direct measurement of leaky gut, but at least it gives us an indication that there are some intestinal challenges occurring. I think there is the opportunity to start developing techniques that would allow us to assess a response, at least on a group of animals, uh, should we have a suspected reason to think they might be uh, challenged, or maybe if we're starting to look at additives that might um, reduce the response at a commercial scale. So I don't have a, a specific answer yet, but I think we're gonna develop those in, in the next few years. Right now, I'm not aware of any specific biomarkers. Okay, excellent. Um, Sylvia is asking, are high starch diets riskier in terms of the intestinal barrier? Um, I think there's opportunity for high starch diets to be riskier if management practices uh, are more variable. So we know, for example, we, we do work with feedlot cattle. We also do work on the dairy side and feedlot cattle that are managed very well actually have a high ability to regulate ruminal pH and maintain high intakes and do very well. 
However, those diets I think are more risky. So if there are situations where feed deliveries are more variable or environmental conditions come in place and heat stress comes and cause cattle to go off feed, I think the risks of disruption are greater. Uh, so I think we have to be a little careful. I, I wouldn't say it's high starch diets per se, um, because under well-managed systems, high starch diets can be um, can be dealt with appropriately by cattle. Mm -hmm. Along that same line, Kirby is asking, what about mycotoxins? Do they damage the gut barrier? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I think it depends on which mycotoxins we're talking about. So if we talk about ergot, uh, I think there's a high probability that ergot does damage, uh, ergot alkaloids do damage the gastrointestinal tract because of uh, partitioning of blood flow and the risk for hypoxic conditions in the gastrointestinal tract. We certainly see reductions in nutrient absorption in cattle-fed elevated ergot uh, concentrations. In terms of some of the other mycotoxins, we have evidence in poultry and swine uh, that DON and aflatoxin and vomitoxin uh, probably do compromise gastrointestinal function, blunt villi. I have not seen data in ruminants. Um, so unless those mycotoxins are detoxified in the rumen, some of which are, uh, to an extent that, you know, the dose, uh, dose response to the intestine is is small enough, I would anticipate that there could be negative consequences. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Dave. There has been a lot of work recently focusing on hindgut acidosis. However, the results are mixed in terms of inflammatory response. Do you think we should be focusing more on the impact of luminal or ruminal acidosis on more proximal regions of the gastrointestinal tract? Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of some recent publications that Dr. Bo Baumgard has, has recently released um, showing really a failure or primarily a failure to induce an inflammatory response with the hindgut acidosis models they've imposed. I'm, I think there could be a challenge with hindgut acidosis, but I would argue it's probably not hindgut acidosis in the absence of other luminal pH responses. And I think we have to be a little bit careful about terminology here because even when we look at low pH in the intestine, quite often we're still approaching seven or we might be just a little below seven. So maybe truly acidotic from a, a chemistry standpoint, but I'm not sure what pH depression is required to induce damage in the gastrointestinal tract especially in the lower gastrointestinal tract, when you look at monogastrics, quite often acidification approaches are viewed as being promotive for gastrointestinal tract function. I think where we have a problem, uh, again, maybe this is my bias, but cattle that are exposed to ruminal acidosis quite often also have lower pH in the intestine. And a behavioral response of cattle with severe ruminal acidosis is for them to go off feed. And so I think it could be related to the combination of, you know, low ruminal pH, greater risk for permeability and inflammatory responses coupled with an off feed event, which um, as I've shown could be a factor that drives a risk for increased permeability. So not necessarily low pH conditions in all regions of the gastrointestinal tract, but you can have higher permeability leading to systemic inflammation. And I think that makes sense with Dr. Baumgard's group because they were generally overfeeding starch uh, to try to induce hindgut acidosis rather than having a perturbation in nutrient supply. Okay. We have time for a few more questions here because we've got a lot of them coming in. So um, the next question comes from Jonas Sarturi, would feeding strategies that condition cattle to consume diets in less hours per day, such as clean bunks by dawn, negatively affect the gut barrier, even if they're not decreasing total intake? I, I do expect that we probably see some negative effects, and I think we need to balance those with, um, I would say, management limitations. I'm aware on the feedlot side that there's an interest in limit feeding and my understanding of the limit feeding approach is uh, 
to make sure that it's easy for us to identify cattle that might be sick. So earlier treatment responses. I think it'll be hard to prove that negative effects caused by that type of feeding management override the potential benefit caused by easier diagnosis of sick animals. So I think we need to look at the big picture first. But if we're inducing a system where we're teaching cattle to slug feed, particularly cattle that will get to a high grain diet scenario, I would suspect we are increasing risk factors for ruminal acidosis, compromised gastrointestinal barrier function, and maybe even liver abscesses. Okay. Well, as our final question, I'll combine a couple here. Are there other specific nutrients, such as yeast, that can help um, cattle recover faster? I think there's a number of promising um, additives that we could be looking at. Um, I think yeast or, or probiotics in general uh, have a, a large potential to help. I think if you think about many of these challenges, and I'm, I'm thinking in this case about, you know, situations where we might be applying antibiotics. Some of those antibiotics could cross the gut barrier or, or maybe oral driven antimicrobials. They're probably disrupting the microflora and rehabilitation of that microflora could help stabilize responses. So probiotics, yeast being one of them could be a factor. I think postbiotics also could play a role here. Uh, butyrate we know has been within a fairly narrow dose range has been very positive in terms of stimulating gastrointestinal tract function. Another molecule I'm quite interested in is betaine. And betaine is, is a methyl donor and is, you know, involved in many of the reactions actually that choline is in, involved in. Betaine is also an osmolite. And so it might help regulate some of the osmotic stress that we know compromises permeability of the gastrointestinal tract. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to investigate. Uh, they're time consuming experiments and, and they're gonna be fairly expensive experiments because we need to challenge cattle in some way uh, to see if we can either prevent the negative effects or accelerate recovery. Okay, well with that, thank you, Greg. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Our Real Science Lecture Series continues with, with educational topics each month, including a new one that we just put up for May with Dr. Trevor DeVries to discuss the nutritional factors around robotic milked cows. Visit balchem.com slash real science for details on all future webinars and to register for our upcoming events. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform and search for Real Science Exchange or visit balchem.com slash podcast. If you want a cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt, just subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll get that off to you right away. On behalf of Balchem, thank you for joining us today.